Hi, welcome to Straight Talk. I want to welcome all of our new viewers to Straight Talk and let you know that our job here is to give you information to make your lives better and our communities better. And today we're going to talk about an issue that's affecting every single community that's watching this show, and that's our nation's heroin and opiate epidemic. And it's something that is destroying lives. More people are dying because of heroin and opiates than die in car crashes in this country. That's how bad this problem is, and it doesn't discriminate. And we're going to find out today the impact that this epidemic is having on women. We don't hear much about women and the heroin epidemic, women going to treatment, and we're going to learn a lot about the impact it has on women from someone who's been there herself. Uh, Colleen Waterfield is joining us. And we're happy to have you, Colleen, Thank on the you show. for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We really appreciate you sharing your story and, your, and the knowledge you have and the great work you're doing to give some information back to other addicts. So thanks. So let's get started kind of at the beginning. Sure. You are a recovering addict. Correct. I am. You got involved pretty early on, I would imagine. Unfortunately, Tell us a little yes. bit about your story. Sure. So, um, you know, I grew up in... A, um, pretty dysfunctional family. Um, in that regard, we were just pretty separate, um, very much different. I have an older sister, she's pretty clean cut, you know, and here comes the rebel child. Um, I grew up in a small town, Varbutus, um, and I think as young as I can remember, I was a pretty, pretty upset kid, you know, um, didn't really ever find my place in the world, never really understood who I truly was. Um, I was bullied a lot when I was younger. Um, I had like buck teeth and freckles and like strawberry blonde hair, so I didn't really fit, you know, the stigma. And, um, you know, around, uh, as I continued to grow, you know, I got into the party scene starting about 13 years old mm. um, is when I first tried my first drug, which was marijuana and alcohol. Um, and immediately when I had tried them, it was like, wow, I'm outgoing. Um, I feel pretty. I uh, fit in. And it just continued to grow. I mean, I can honestly say from that first time, from that first hit and that first sip, it was like, this is it. This is that feeling that I've always tried to reach and, um, you know, the confidence that I always wanted to have. And um, as I continued to get older, um, the drugs got harder. Um, you know, I struggled. I had a very, I was very rebellious. Um, you know, I think a lot of that stemmed from the bullying. You know, I started to grow up. I started to, you know, mold myself into the stigma, if you will. And um, I started to, you know, become a pretty violent, pretty angry person. And once again, I think, you know, I really didn't know my place in the world. So I start, went on to harder drugs, um, ecstasy, cocaine, into my senior year of high school. Um, I barely graduated by the skin of my teeth. You know, um, I had actually started out in a Catholic high school, um, pretty much was asked to leave because of my behaviors and my drug use. And, um, drinking during school hours, you know, and to me it was just like, they don't understand, like I party really hard. Um, I don't have a problem and truth was, and really I didn't know at that time that the problem was already almost full blown. Um, I had went through some pretty traumatic experiences in high school that led me to go deeper in to numb a lot of feelings. And um, to, by the age of 20, I was full into Percocets and, um, Percocets. So you went from high school mm -hmm. where you were just starting to get harder, harder drugs, absolutely stronger drugs. And then when you left high school, then you really, it just really took off. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, I was really big into sports in high school, um, but my grades weren't up to par. So therefore I couldn't participate in sports. Um, so at that point in my senior year, when that's when the drugs started to get harder, I started to go to parties a lot. Um, and I pretty much just partied my way through high school. So when I exited high school, I didn't really exit on the best foot. Um, there was no sports. There was no, I really even looked at sports as an obsession. It was like if I didn't have something to do or something to obsess over, then the drugs, you know, were suffi like sufficing. And um, basically, um, I got into a crowd. I was told about pills. I tried pills. Um, I got really sick. I started to use 
from that first day, um, it really tore me up. I went, um, by the end of my, before my first rehab trip, I was in and out of hospitals. Um, my body was pretty much just falling apart. Um, I was doing up to 12, 12 to 15 Percocets a day. And Percocet is pretty much like heroin. Absolutely. Um, they, we hear a lot about oxycodone. Yes, they call it like the synthetic heroin yeah. almost. And, right. um, you know, I remember like when I was starting to get harder into it, people kept saying like, you know, you have a problem. And truth is back then, even like going through high school, I can't really recall them talking about addiction much. And, um, you know, where I was on the other side of town, like when I was growing up, I wasn't always in the best high school. And it was really the people that I chose. It wasn't anything about the high school. So when I got out and I was surrounding myself with these people, um, you know, like I said, I started to get really sick mm. and I started to use alone. And um, I started to go into places where I shouldn't have been going. And um, towards my, before my first treatment um, center, I was about, 95 pounds. Wow. Um, I was in the hospital. I had a severe kidney infection that had moved into my bloodstream. And I had, um, because here I am self medicating, I, I d couldn't even take care of myself. You know, I, um, you know, I, my hygiene was poor. Um, you know, my hair was falling out. I just looked like the walking dead. Um, and literally, I was. I was so dead inside, mm -hmm. as, you know, especially Were you doing heroin at this point? And not at this point. And then Still I Still just doing the Percocet. Absolutely. Wow. And then I entered into treatment, and um, I really wasn't fully prepared. My parents were kind of taken back. You know, when I was at the hospital, I decided to get honest. And um, I turned 21 on August 1st, and I went in six days later. Um, and I spent in my time in a 30-day inpatient. Uh, I didn't take it seriously at all. Um, I was very scared still, very broken. Um, I really didn't see that this was a problem. I thought it was just like a point in my life. And after I exited there, I tried heroin for my first time. Wow. Let's just take a break there. I mean, I, it's an amazing story. Thank you. Very common probably, Abs and, but it's an amazing it. story to be able to go through all that Mm -hmm. and come out where you are today, which we'll talk more about later. Yeah, but you should be commended for what you went through. Thank and you. And thank God you survived. I mean, <laughs> that, I'm sure you, you probably could have died dozens of times throughout that experience. Yes. But, you know, I wanted the people to hear your story. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break and come back. And I want to talk about, you talked about going to treatment. Yes. And about women going to treatment. Mm -hmm you know, and how difficult that is or isn't and what's available okay. and what you went through. Okay, sure. So hang in there. Okay. I appreciate you being here. No, no and we're problem. talking with Colleen Waterfield, who is really helping a lot of people. So hang in there, okay? When we come back to Straight Talk, we're going to keep talking with Colleen about her addiction, about women's addiction, and what you can do to help someone you, you care about. That's what this is all about. Stay with us. We're coming right back to Straight Talk. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice, single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers, but you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Find fun activities to do, like boating and biking, or camping and hiking, plus much more. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. Don't allow your weight to threaten your health or control your future. Excess weight or obesity 
can cause emotional and physical health risks. But you can take control. The Your Weight Matters campaign offers free resources and tips to help you measure and understand your weight. Take the Your Weight Matters Challenge. The free toolkit prepares you to speak with a healthcare provider about your weight. Your weight does matter. Take the challenge and take control today. Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. Again, I want to welcome our new viewers and let you know that we're talking about the heroin and opiate epidemic and its impact on women. And Colleen Waterfield is joining us. She's telling us her story of addiction and recovery, Absolutely. I want to say. And also want to mention that you are now working in the field. Yes, You're I You're working at the Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, helping others. And we'll talk some about what you're doing there later. But I want sure. people to know that what they're hearing from you is an uh, unbelievable story. Thank you. But here you are coming out the other end helping people, and that's wonderful. We're, we're talking about your history. You started when you were young. You started with pot, mm -hmm. ended up doing Percocet, then doing heroin. I mean, you went the whole gamut, mm -hmm. you know, right up the ladder. Then you started going into rehabs. Now, we talk about women in treatment mm -hmm. and how hard it is for women to either find treatment or... They don't want to go to treatment. What was it like for you? And, what do you see, and also, what do you see with women and their either refusal to go or they don't want to go? What are those barriers? So I think a lot of the barriers, I mean, uh, most common is children and wives. Um, you know, uh, through being in treatment myself and working in treatment, I see a lot of women struggle to make mm. that first call, but I'm a mother. But I have children I have to take care of. Mm. But I have a husband that I have to tend to or, you know, and that seems to always be the most common. And um, the sad part is, is, you know, they don't quite see that, like, at that stage, like, sometimes we're not really mothers and sometimes we're not really wives, and, but you're important, too. And I think, you know, as a woman in recovery, we just become so broken and the shame and guilt, you know, overrides us, you know, just dealing in my personal story with, you know, explaining to my parents, it was just like my mother was, my, I mean, I remember the words of my mother saying, but I mean, you, you can't be an addict. It was almost like she didn't understand. And as I continued in treatment, I would see l far less women than there were men. And, um, and I think that a lot of that stems from, you know, being mothers, being wives, um, almost like it's afraid to come out that like, I'm a woman and I'm an addicted to drugs. And, you know, another thing could be body image issues. It can be, you know, trauma related. I see a lot of that too, you know, the self-medication and, um, but I don't have a problem right. because you're so self-medicated and you're so into this almost delusional world that like, I, if I come off of these, who am I gonna become? Am I just gonna be a shell of a person still because you're so broken? And um, I mean, those are truly the barriers that I yeah. see a lot with do, working. Do you see women, are they afraid that they'll lose their children and lose their husbands so they can't afford to take care of themselves? Usually that is what I see, uh, mostly more common with the women with children. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have anywhere to take my child. Right. Um, I don't, some of them don't have family or, um, the husband almost shuns them, you know, sometimes, or sometimes it's, they're very supportive, but the wife's like, but I can't, my children can never know, or it has to do with the community that they're surrounding themselves with. But what will my friends think? But, you know, um, because you look at a mother and she's nurturing and she's caring. And when you hear that she's on drugs or she's an alcoholic, it's like, well, oh, my, oh my you not know that, my daughter yes right? not like, not my mom like, like women aren't supposed to have problems absolutely and, and take care of themselves absolutely yeah. like you're supposed to you know tend to the house duties or you're providing for the family as well or you know you're taking care of your kids you have to be the one that you know uh, you know read them a bedtime story and they probably think they might lose their kids I mean, um, if you're a single mother if you're a single mother and you go into treatment it's got, you have to have that fear that something's going to happen to your kids. And I can imagine there's not many programs where, a, where a woman can go in with her kids. Um, through my experience, you know, of living in a recovery house and working in treatment, that's a common question that comes up. Well, what am I going to do after the fact? Um, where am I going to stay with my kids, you know, d during this time? Um, mm -hmm. And it's almost like, 
you know, trying to convince him like everything's going to be okay because it is if you continue to put in this hard work. But at the end of the day, that is one of the biggest problems. But I'm going to lose my children because in this in this day and age that can happen and it's it's so realistic and at the same time it's like because the heroin epidemic has gotten so big it's like the help is there more though that i've seen in the from when i first people seem into to recovery. be more aware absolutely we're seeing more programs open up to help people absolutely i do i agree with you i think the, the public is well informed that, that we've got a big medical problem here absolutely and we have to do something about it but what but the question is are we doing enough for women because i can i don't know what the statistics are but i would imagine as the numbers go up for everyone that's going to go up for women too um i believe it has you know mm -hmm. um now you work in in a rehab center yes. here, you know at maryland addiction mm -hmm. recovery center are you seeing more women come in? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when I first came into recovery and I first started working at Mark, I saw a lot less women. And as you know, the doors are continuing to open, and you know, we're expanding. The amount of women that reach that are reaching out is phenomenal to me, and their mothers, and their wives, mm -hmm. and their young women, and you know, some of them are basically you know still children, and it's like a beautiful thing to watch that, you know you don't, you're not alone, you know, and that's, you know, the biggest thing I think for anyone in recovery, but as, as, especially women, you know, that we're a power together and that we can strive and we can be successful and we don't have to let this define us. But you said before something interesting that they say they want to be mother, they have to be mothers and wives, but when they're addicts, they're not very good mothers and they're not very good wives, are No, they? and that's the truth. And yeah. you know, um, But they think they are. Yes, and you know, once again, that takes it yeah. back to the nature of addiction. Um, we think we're okay. We think we're solving our problems. We think we're truly better people with the substances. And truth is, you're really not tending to the needs and you're not taking yeah. care of them, let alone yourself. Now you went into rehab probably what, a couple times before? You, you said you weren't ready at first. <laughs> and that's probably common for a lot of people, women included, but that, that they go in and they're just not ready. Um, you know, mine was ultimately like an ultimatum from my family. You know, it's either go to treatment or be homeless. Right. Um, and as I, you know, I did have many rehab trips. But as I continue to go in, and I can honestly say, even through every trip, especially the last, the women were what helped me together. Um, you know, when I would get off track being a young woman in recovery, sometimes, you know, you want that acceptance, you want that validation from a man, like, like I'm pretty, right? Like, I'm, I'm an acceptable member of society. And when I focused on that, I always went off track, right. you know, and obviously a lot of other factors, you know, played into that. But once I stuck with the women and the, the bond that you hold together, because there are depths that you go to that men don't that go to. That kept you going. That, that kept, you kept going. me, yeah. that kept the hope and the faith yeah. that like, I can, like, I'm, I'm worth it. Like, I'm, okay. I'm a woman and it's beautiful to be well, in recovery. We're glad you're here. You know, Thank you. Uh, and you're a beautiful person, and it's just wonderful that you're here and giving back. You I know, and helping that. other people, and I think that's important. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, I want to talk more about the rehab program. What's available? Sure. What's good for people through your experience? Okay, sure. thanks Absolutely. again. Thank Hang you. In there. When we come back to Straight Talk, we're going to continue talking with. Colleen Waterfield, Waterfield about her own addiction and recovery and what you can do to help someone you care about. To so stay with us, we're coming right back to Straight Talk. I just need a second. Is your weight holding you back? Are everyday tasks getting harder and harder to do? Did you see this? Hmm? Your cousin's in the hospital from a heart attack. Really? Health risks associated with excess weight or obesity can be serious. But you can do something about it. I know you're worried. I found this. Take the Your Weight Matters Challenge. Visit yourweightmatters.org where you'll find free resources to help you take control. You can start improving your life right away. 
Download the free toolkit to prepare you to speak with a healthcare provider about your weight and health. Your weight does matter. Accept the challenge and take charge today. Visit yourweightmatters.org. I had big plans. I had my career path all planned out. While I was on a combat patrol in Baqa, Iraq, a rocket propelled grenade took my arm off at the shoulder. When I came home, I felt alone. My family was around me, but I couldn't talk to them about what, I, what I'd seen and what I'd done. I remember just thinking, man, the way I am right now, I don't want to live. I was discharged from the Army, and I've been working with the Wounded Warrior Project since 2007. Warriors don't have to be severely wounded to be with the Wounded Warrior Project. We do have a lot of guys that have post-traumatic stress disorder. Being able to share your story, I guess it kind of helps you wrap your mind around what did happen over there. Just because you've left the military doesn't mean your life is over. Because when these guys are coming home, I'm kind of leading and training them. Instead of for combat, I'm leading and training them to heal. If I come away with anything from Wounded Warrior Project, it's them giving my life back. My name is Norby, and yes, I do suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but I'm okay. Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. We're talking with Colleen Waterfield about addiction. Her addiction, she's in recovery. She's a woman who's fought hard for her, for her sobriety, and she's been clean and helping others now. Colleen, thank you for being with, on the show. Oh, thank you for thank having me. Thank you for the work that you do. We're talking about treatment. You know, you got to that point where you went in several times, <laughs> and we know that that happens with addicts, yeah. that they've got to reach that point where, but they're learning something all the time, and one time it finally kicks in. Yes. And it did for you. And you went through and you got clean. You've been clean for several years. Yes. Which is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And now you're helping others. When we get somebody into treatment, mm -hmm. we always talk about, well, it's residential treatment. Mm -hmm. And that means what? They live there. Yes, correct. So we have like a community living component of right. Mark. Um, and basically we have it, uh, you know, we house a certain amount of patients and they do intensive you know, outpatient throughout the day, Monday through Friday, um, you know, hours of group, gender specific, which, you know, like we've been talking about women, but also men, you know, being right. separated to really address the issues between men and women mm -hmm. and having that bond that we've been talking about and also living together in that type of environment and having that safe place mm -hmm. to be, to make mistakes because you're going to make mistakes, but also to have that 24 seven support. Mm -hmm especially needed. Yeah, and that's, that's off the street. Absolutely. Now you're getting off, the, you're away from all the, the negativity and the people that want to hurt you and get you to use again. Now you're mm -hmm. in a positive. And that goes on for about a month or so. Correct. And then you go into another phase. Is that how that works? <laughs> so throughout our residential program, when you come in, really focus, get, um, they set you up with the treatment plan, the therapist, to really focus on the main, you know, priorities of your treatment program right. um, and then as you continue to grow in there and you continue you know we give them enough freedom that they can still know what it's like to be in society but like I said come back to have that support and then eventually they'll move forth they'll start to get back in contact with their families work on family dynamics because you know it's gotcha. very important and then eventually moving to the vocational process where they begin job right. searching now the, the recovery house mm -hmm halfway house, recovery house. Mm -hmm. They're all over. It's yes. a very big thing right yes. now for people. They're, they're important. How important are they? Um, in my personal opinion, in my recovery, it was one of the biggest heartbeats Critical. that I had. Because you, you know? had a place to live with people who were also in recovery, absolutely. You know, who supported I, you. Absolutely. I was surrounded by love. And once again, I made mistakes, but I had these women that were there 24 seven to hold me up and support me and, you know, hold me accountable because my behaviors weren't always correct. And, you know, you, it's like a big family. It's like a second home. And you go to a recovery house mm -hmm. and, it's, and there's what, five, eight, 10 people that live there or something, whatever. Um, it could be more. It Mine had 14. More. Okay, so 14. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's staying clean, everyone's getting a job, everyone's paying rent. Mm -hmm. So you're really working your way back into society. Yes, you're learning how to take care of yourself in everyday life. Right. You know, having somebody there, you know, and incorporating recovery and learning how to balance those because it's not always that easy because we do have responsibilities. Now you work with a lot of, <clears throat> call them alumni, mm -hmm. people that have been through the program that, yes. that want to stay clean They've been in a recovery house. They've gone through the whole process, mm -hmm. 
but you somehow keep them connected because they, they need that. I mean, I mean, we have AA, NA, lots of support groups, but you're working with alumni to keep them connected. Yes. So um, one of the things that you see a lot when patients are in the house is how much they can't wait to help and come back to mm. that treatment facility that helped them. So basically what the alumni program does is give former patients that opportunity to give back, you know, um, to come and pick the patients up and take them out and show them like, I've been literally exactly right, where right. you were, and here I am today, you know, and I'm clean and I'm sober and I'm doing life because that's usually what we don't know how to do. We don't know how to do life. And it's also, it's really the alumni that create it. You know, I'm just kind of there to coordinate it. It's because of their passion and their drive to help others that they make this program possible and in the process they help everybody that comes through those doors, including, you know, the program overall. Like if it wasn't for them, you know, we, what's our purpose, you know? Right, you just kind of- people They go, are the future. Well, well, they go through and then they're, out, they're, <coughs> they're dumped out, out, out in society, yes, not prepared. Absolutely. And, and, and it's a fascinating thing because it probably helps the alumni as much as it helps the new people in the program. Yes, because- you're giving, you're kind of giving it away, but meanwhile it's, helping you. Yes, and part of the alumni program, we assign when a patient comes in and they're in that admission process and they're scared and they're fragile, we assign them alumni to contact and the alumni are aware that these patients could call you at any time and they may need to be taken to a meeting or yeah. they just need a helping yeah. hand. Now your message out there, if there's a woman out there struggling with her addiction, mm -hmm. what do you want to tell her? You're beautiful, you're worth it, you are just as important as anybody else. This isn't the end of the road and you are our future and continue and reach out and love yourself and learn to love yourself because just because you're a woman doesn't mean yeah. you're not worth it. And there's help out there. Absolutely. Hopefully, you know, that people can find some help when no matter which city you're in, you know, this epidemic is all over this country. It is. And people need to reach out and get help and look out for each other, especially the women, like you said, the mothers, the wives that people may not pay attention to. Well, you're a, you're a hero of mine. You're, a, you're, you're the best. Thank you and so I much. And I can't thank you enough for being on the show. And thank you again. Thanks, sure. Straight Talk, we're talking about heroin, opiates, women in treatment. Get help. If there's someone you know about that has a problem you care about, please get them help. If you have a problem, get help for yourself. I want to thank Colleen for being on the show and sharing her amazing story. I want to thank you for watching Straight Talk, and we'll see you next time.